My name is Robert Gleason. I was born in a house right over here on Stanford, 401 Stanford Southeast, April 18th, 1930. I grew up in the neighborhood. I attended University Heights Elementary School at age five. In 1935, I was one selected out of hundreds of five-year-old children in the state of New Mexico to start the first grade at five years old because of a special IQ test. I still think they made a mistake on the score, but anyway. This is what I looked like when I was about four years old. That picture was taken in front of our house on Stanford. There a man came up and down the street with a pony and a camera. And for two dollars, he'd take the kid's picture on horseback. Our Boy Scout troop used to meet up here at the fire station. They sponsored our troop, it was Troop 3. After the Boy Scout meeting was over, they used to let us go upstairs and slide down the fireman's pole. We thought that was great. I remember my parents' home on Stanford. We had a bathtub in the house, but the water wasn't hooked up to it. Our water was outside. It was one of these frost-free faucet things that you pulled a handle. We could have all the water we wanted. My daddy said, we have running water. We run outside to get it. <laughs> Mama cooked with a wood stove. We cut wood for us boys. That was our job, to keep the wood for the stove. Where did the wood come from? Uh, mostly we would get them from a local sawmill. They'd dump us a whole pile of scraps, little chips and scraps and hunks, chunks, and you could get the whole truckload of it dumped right in your backyard for like $15. And when that used to happen, us boys, we used to go out there and get stuff and we'd see what we could make out of this or that, you know, all different shapes and sizes. But, uh, once in a while, we'd uh, buy wood from wood haulers that would come by with a, a horse and wagon and it'd be loaded with wood and they'd dump it there in my folks' yard. This is stuff we mostly had to cut. It was a lot of kind of stuff, maybe a couple, three inches around. They used to do that a lot in the old days. They used to come by our house on Stamford. It was just an old dirt street. The wood haulers, we'd see them real often. And sometimes we'd look out and we'd see a whole herd of sheep coming down the street or cattle. We were a witness to the great Oki migration back in the 30s. It started in you know, those Dust Bowl days, but it continued. But uh, let's see where uh, Yale Park is now. It used to be a huge, it went clear over this way. But uh, that used to be kind of a stopping place for people that were traveling through town. And a lot of these people, they'd have their whole family in the car and they'd run out of gas and run out of food and water. And my mother used to get things together. And several times a week in the summer, she'd go over there and she'd hand out things to people, sandwiches and things. And uh, she had a big, pitcher she'd make Kool-Aid in and keep an ice bucket in the car, you know, and, and uh, we had milk goats at the time on our place, at our place on Stanford. We milked the goats. Mama sold the goat milk and we all were raised on goat milk. That's why I got these little things here on my head. <laughs> our next door neighbor, Mr. Lang, was a TB patient and uh, they let him stay at home and they had this big closed in, uh, screened in porch and he spent most of his time out there. Two doors down from the low bowl used to be a bowling alley, the sports bowl. Frank Peloso built that business and ran it as a bowling alley for many years. And a bunch of us started working as pin boys at the hilltop bowling alley that was down uh, past Yale there, half a block or so. We worked there. 
We used to set pens for four cents a line, and sometimes we'd get tips, which was pretty good. Then when this one opened up over here, they had machines that were a lot easier to use. They were air operated, it didn't take so much sweat and muscle. But they only paid us three cents a line over here, <laughs> but it was easier. So we used to kind of go back and forth. And then um, sometimes Frank Peloso, he really knew how to handle boys. And uh, he used to want us there available. If people came in the bowl, we'd need to be there to set the pins. And he used to wonder how to keep us there, so he made a deal with the Lobo Theater on Saturdays, we could go in there and watch the movies and the cartoons. And if he wanted us, needed us, he'd just go over there and get us and go to work. That was really good. In 1929, the start of the Great Depression, my dad lost his job in Savannah, and he had a brother in Fort Worth who had a furniture store and we moved there and my dad went to work uh, in the furniture store and uh, they lost the store mm -hmm. later and my dad worked around in various places. He worked in men's clothing stores and anyway, he ended up uh, getting a job with Montgomery Ward, and they transferred him to Albuquerque, and that's how we got here. Uh, you can blame it on Montgomery Ward. <laughs> <laughs> we, we joined the church when the church was dedicated and had I've been a member ever since. But we went to church down in the store building on Third Street and there's a lot of stories about the women of the church at that time what they served lunches every day for 25 cents or something like that. 35 cent chicken lunches. Yeah, to raise money to build a church. We had a Sunday school class that John and I was members of the Come Double class, which was a, a large, very active class for many years. I may get some of this stuff garbled <laughs> up. Correct me if I do. The first teacher of the class was a retired minister that was here. And I don't remember how long he taught the class, a few years. And he decided he was going to retire from that. So they, and I wasn't there. John probably was when they were trying to get a, a uh, new teacher for the class. And finally, they got a guy by the name of Les Dye who said he would take the job as teacher temporarily <laughs> until they could get another teacher. <laughs> And how long was it? 28 years later. <laughs> like that. It was a long time. I have hanging in my living room a map of Albuquerque, a U.S. Geological Survey map, 1938, which shows the platted parts of Albuquerque and it runs from the river up to about Carlisle. And that was the only platted part of Albuquerque. <laughs> yeah. I'm Eleanor Kelly Cooley, and I was born in Wisconsin in January 1942. But because of health reasons, we moved to New Mexico in 1945. 
And my folks tell me we were on the road on VJ Day. Uh, we ended up having to stay in a motel for six weeks trying to find a house to buy. There were only two houses for sale in Albuquerque. When we finally did find a house, it was right down here on 3305 Campus Boulevard. Almost every Friday evening, we'd walk up and go to the Brass Kettle. It was a little restaurant and get a hamburger and fries, which was a new kind of thing in the <laughs> late 40s. Bill. I remember when Knob Hill was built. It was a big deal, one of the first shopping centers we'd ever heard of. <laughs> yeah. You know. R.B. Waterman. Before we got a TV in 1949, we would walk up and watch the Lone Ranger through the furniture store window yeah. <laughs> up on Central. My sister and I got our picture in the paper when we were probably 10, 10-ish. Um, a reporter came by. Campus was running literally curb to curb, over, oh, sure. the, over the curb with water, and we were out in our swimsuits in the water, and this reporter came by <laughs> and if I'd had time, if I'd known, I could have brought the picture. He took a picture of us in the water on campus, down in front of our house on, here. Up it, and uh, it got in the, on the front page of the journal. And I do remember that my, the first apartment my folks rented for my grandmother, when she came down in 48, 47 or 48, I'm not sure which, uh, my mom would not let us go in to talk about renting a place because the woman had TB. Mm -hmm. And we were parked on Central, aimed down towards that bridge, you know, going down Central. And uh, being bored, I was, I think I was five at the time, I got in the seat and started driving the car and got, somehow got it going down the street <laughs> with, my sis, with my sister asleep in the back seat. And some nice man managed to stop it. The Whitmores that came down here from Iowa, uh, they went, they brought it down to get treated and their treatment was to be out essentially in the open and dry climate. And so they mm -hmm. lived in a tent in this area east of, the, of that hospital. His doctor didn't think he had long to live and he came down and one of which real joys was that he outlived six doctors. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he was not a young man when he died. It was my really second part of my family. My, First wife died after we'd been married 57 years. And uh, having a family here at church that we'd grown up with all our adult life was really nice. My husband's office, he was a dentist, was in the Knob Hill Shopping Center. It was very new at that time. In fact, his father uh, rented his office space when he was still in the Navy. Wagaman was building it, I, I don't know the exact time, I would think it was about 47, and um, uh, he was still in the Navy, and um, uh, his father, thinking, oh, you know, we'll get space for him, so he talked to Mr. Wagaman and rented the space in the Knob Hill uh, uh, Center at that time. It was a shopping center, uh, less artistic as functional, I mean, it had a ladies dress shop, a men's dress shop, a five and ten cent store, a, a drug store, a children's shop, a barber shop, a shoe shine shop. A, uh, it, it was a, a functional, what I called a functional mm -hmm. shopping center. It's a little more artsy now, but at that time it was where you went to buy your groceries, your dime store things, and, and uh, a drug store, and, and um, uh, uh, it was a good area. We liked it very much and, and uh, as I said, established our home in the near area. David rode his bike to work lots of times. Uh, we had only had one car and, and uh, I guess he thought I needed to get the groceries uh, to have his dinner ready and so he rode a bike to, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, his, to the office. One thing I really remembered about the 
Knob Hill area is that in the early days it seemed like we did get more moisture and uh, when it did rain in our thunderstorms in the summertime, Central Avenue became a, a river and uh, I'd seen it a number of times almost curb to curb uh, coming down East Central and uh, of course it always drew a crowd right out down here at Hermosa where there's a little dip and all the, the water would, would uh, rush down to Campus Boulevard there uh, <laughs> and uh, that was a uh, stop traffic you might say because people would get flooded out just trying to get through that turn of water. <laughs> north of, uh, of the campus, we called it, that time was campus, I don't know, it's copper up east to campus down here, and it did flow mm -hmm. gutter to gutter and fast, and I mean it just went so fast, and my children, our neighbor kids used to get in a bucket, I mean a big bucket and float down there, but my children were not allowed to go down to campus when it was raining that hard. <laughs> Manal was not paved, it was just a dirt road down a hill. Um, the uh, when the wind blew, oh my gosh! I mean, I couldn't see out my front windows because our road was dirt. There were dirt roads all around us, and um, uh, the windowsills were just uh, thick with sand. Dr. Rice, who had the Women and Children's Hospital down on Central, lived right behind us at Sherry. Uh, I mean, on the corner, and they were they had their children and mine were were uh, good friends, and. Um, I was talking to her not long ago. I said, do you remember Chacho? Chacho was a monkey that was on a chain in the, in the cottonwood tree behind us and, and the kids would run down and he would just chatter and you didn't get, get near him because he would bite, but he, <laughs> he could maneuver up that cottonwood tree from the bottom all the way up and never get tangled. I, it just amazed me he was chained or something, but he could scoot up there and he was a neighbor for a long time. Elk Kirky was more Western. Yeah. It wasn't as sophisticated or anything, and of course that's what, as I said, fascinated me, the, the West. And I said, as I said, I wouldn't ever tell my husband that I thought maybe that's what I fell in love with because he was from no. the West, but you know, <laughs> he had his shaps and his things and he grew up in the country and he could, I'd watch him when we'd go to his uh, brother's place and they'd rope throw, brand, and you know, this was just all things I watched in yeah. the movies back in Milwaukee, and I was just bug-eyed. I mean, I, I loved every minute of it, so, uh, uh, but it was, it, uh, it, it was a western town. The houses in most parts of Knob Hill were developed by a small number of builders. They uh, were people who had a lot of uh, creativity. Some of them used used styles that were commonplace throughout the country. Some of them developed their own styles. But in any event, they developed a lot of really pretty styles. And through uh, some strange quirk of good luck, a large number of those old houses still exist today, pretty much with their same historic character as when they were new. And that's one of the things that really gives Knob Hill and Yo's a lot of pleasure is that they live in almost like a museum. It's like a place, a, a living museum, where they can walk up and down the street and get a good sense of what it was like to live in Knob Hill in those times. Most of the builders in Knob Hill used styles that were popular at the time. Some of them combined styles. Some of them kind of came up with their own styles. The styles would come into fashion and go out of fashion, a lot like clothing. A lot of people came this way on the train starting in 1880 for tourism or for relocation. And uh, of course by the 20s and 30s, some of them were coming by car, not all of them. But boy, they went just went nuts about all the exciting sense of place in New Mexico and they wanted this in their own home. So builders developed the Spanish Pueblo revival style. It's called a revival because it went back uh, in Pueblo times to as early as people were using adobe or even plastering rock structures. And uh, these, these builders revived this style. There was this big uh, wash going through the middle of Monta Vista. And uh, it was a big one. Um, 
was called Campus Wash. I have no idea why it wasn't called Campus Arroyo, but it was called Campus Wash. And this thing uh, drained a very large area. And until very recently, it ran a lot of water quite commonly. I've heard of people saying that kids would run down there and play in the water about three or four times every summer. I talked to a, a neat guy named Bill Nolan who has lived on the second house north of Campus Boulevard, formerly Campus Wash, since he was about 13. I suppose that was in the 40s. And he said that one afternoon in August he was in the house watching TV, probably listening to the radio. <laughs> and uh, his dad, it was raining out, and his dad said, Bill, come out here. And so he ran out there in the front yard and uh, he said, let's go down and watch the wash. And this wash was just ripping, Bill says. And uh, all kinds of debris was floating by and eventually here came a guy floating by in a canoe. <laughs> and uh, Bill and his dad asked the guy, where are you going? And the guy says, I'm going to work. <laughs> <laughs> My dad's name was Gordon Ferguson. In 1945, my dad designed a small office for himself and his growing business at 111 Amherst Drive, southeast, and it was completed in uh, 1946. My mom kept a scrapbook of a lot of my dad's buildings, and this would have this was in the. Um, she even wrote Albuquerque Journal. 92345 Architect Builds Own Office. This photo shows Knob Hill Shopping Center being built. And the neat thing is my dad's building is right there on the edge. You can see it. My dad's office grew. He hired more architects and for many years uh, it was called Ferguson, Stevens, Mowry, and Pearl. The firm um, is still in existence. Uh, it's now called SMPC. Uh, it's larger now. It still sits on the corner of Amherst and Silver, uh, right there by Knob Hill Shopping Center. The house was originally built in 1927 by the Gallus family, H.L. Gallus Sr. family. H.L. Uh, Gallus Jr., Hickam, uh, lived in the house as a teenager. We had encountered some things in the house, uh, like this house has a nearly full basement. Uh, it was one huge, large, empty room when we moved here, but there was a great big bar in the corner of the room, and the room was painted red, and one of the things they had done in the basement was put down vinyl linoleum tile. Later on. Somebody had put it down. Yes, later on. Uh, so one of the things that happened is if you took a wet mop and mopped the uh, uh, linoleum tile, red paint would seep up between the seams of, in the tile. So being true historical people, the first thing I asked was, Mr. Gallus, why is that basement so red? The paint is seeping through the tile. Oh, did they put tile down there? Well, Mrs. H, that's where the Lobo Cub met. That's where we hired and fired the football and basketball coaches. That's where we played poker. And Ron and I to this day swear that's probably what happened in our basement. Two Houses Down was owned by Mr. Ream. His wife had died. He would be out walking and I'd visit with him at, when I was out in the yard. And he was telling me when he built his house, which was before us, we think, he would come home from Albuquerque High and the, he... The Albuquerque, the old the Albuquerque, old Albuquerque, Albuquerque High, High on Central. The one that been converted to apartments down on Central. And he would get his golf balls and his golf club and he would go out and hit golf balls. And at that time, the edge of UNM was Zimmerman Library, you know? He says, I could hit balls as far as I wanted to. Where Walgreens is now, you know that property? Right there, it used to be a big old barn dance building, a old frame rack of a building. It was like a barn dance. And on Saturday nights, 
they used to have that going and it used to be so noisy and the neighborhood complained about it so many times it'd keep everybody awake till two, three o'clock after a Saturday night and there was always somebody getting stabbed or shot and, and the police, the city limits was right there at Girard. And the police used to sit over there on Central just waiting for people to come. <laughs> then they bust them because they knew they'd been more likely drinking. So anyway, the neighborhood complained so much and they even started a lawsuit at one time against this place for the noise ordinance. And they said, but, but that doesn't apply because we're not in the city limits, see, okay. So one time the place caught on fire and everybody got out, you know, and everything, but uh, somebody called the fire department, and they were way downtown, there wasn't any this way, but the fire department's response was, well, you're outside of the city limits, we can't help you. So they let it burn to the ground. Oh, the people were so happy over there, finally. Oh, shine on, oh, silver moon, Ocean is glowing o'er the cool waters, soft winds are blowing. Hark how the sailors cry, joyously echo nigh, Santa Lucia. Santa Lucia. Now if I had my hat, I'd go around looking. <laughs> I used to do a lot with the, then the Albuquerque Civic Chorus. They recruited me years ago and I did a lot of that sort of thing.